Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering blood disorders, and that will include polycythemia, that will include a vitamin B12 deficiency, that will include blood transfusions, and the nursing interventions for possible complications that can come along with the blood transfusions. Guys, go ahead, press that like button. You know you're gonna like this video. Press that red notification so you'll be notified every time a new video is released. And don't forget, um, I have audio lessons available for you on my website nexusnursinginstitute.com and you guys can catch me on other social media platforms if you want to get some studying in during the week i'm on tiktok instagram and facebook as you know i pray before my videos if you're new to the channel you're not into it that's fine fast forward but if you would like prayer go ahead close your eyes by your head father god thank you lord for all that you've done for us thank you for waking us up this morning thank you for this opportunity that we have at this moment, Lord, to go over this information. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me this opportunity to do what I love, which is sharing this knowledge. And I pray for every single viewer right now, Lord, please help them to understand this information, help them to retain this information, Father God. When they are testing, Lord, and they want to choose a crazy answer, Father God, I ask that you please, 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 Jesus, help them and help them choose the correct answer and not the crazy answer that they were thinking of, Father God. Let them hear my voice in their head telling them, don't you dare, and for them to choose the correct answer. Thank you, Father God, for every single person that is viewing this video. They've come here for a reason, and I ask that you please help them, help them to pass their test, help them to get their license, and help them to be a blessing to others. Thank you for all you've done and all you continue doing. Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, let's get started. First question. Polycythemia is frequently associated with COPD. When assessing for this complication, the nurse should monitor for one, pallor and cyanosis, two, dyspnea on exertion, three, elevated hemoglobin, or four, decreased hematocrit. And guys, the correct answer is three, elevated hemoglobin. So I want you to think about it. The patient has COPD, which means they have decreased what? Oxygen. So what the body does in polycythemia, the body tries to uh, correct not having enough oxygen by producing all of these RBCs. Why RBCs, Professor D? Well, what's inside of the RBCs? Hemoglobin. What does hemoglobin carry? oxygen so that patient who has copd that's not getting enough oxygen the body's trying to get more oxygen by increasing the oxygen carrying capacity so that's why you see the rbcs go up because inside of the rbcs is a hemoglobin and the hemoglobin carries oxygen look at that polycythemia poly too many psi cells themia blood too many cells in the blood which cells rbcs that's why the correct answer is three, elevated hemoglobin, because it's that hemoglobin that's inside of the RBCs that's carrying the oxygen. Now, let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, pallor and cyanosis. I just told you in polycythemia, the RBCs will be increased. RBCs are what? Red. So that patient's going to look flush. They're going to look pinkish. They're going to um, have that um, pink coloring, not paleness. So it can't be one. Two, dyspnea on exertion. Uh, patient may have dyspnea on exertion because of the COPD, not because of the polycythemia. Remember, we're talking about polycythemia, so that's false. Four, decreased hematocrit, wrong. Hematoc um, yeah, decreased hematocrit, wrong. We're gonna expect to see that hematocrit, that hemoglobin what? Increase, not decrease. So the correct answer, guys, is number three. Practitioner orders two units of packed RBCs for a client who's bleeding. Before blood administration, the nurse's priority is one, obtaining client's vital signs, two, letting the blood reach room temperature, three, monitoring H and H levels, or four, determining proper typing and cross-matching of blood. Okay, guys, and the priority by far is number four because we don't care about anything else on that list if that blood is incompatible because we're not trying to kill our patient, are we? So number four is the correct answer. Um, number one, obtaining the vital signs. Yes, we want to obtain the vital signs, but we're not even going to get to that point if we don't have that right blood. Two, letting the blood reach room temperature. Actually, you want that blood to still be what? Cool. Matter of fact, let me tell you something. If that blood has been at room temperature for 30 minutes, you have to return it back to the blood bank. It's not good anymore. 
choice uh, three, monitoring H&H, &H, absolutely. But your first priority to keep your patient alive is making sure that there's no blood incompatibility. So the correct answer is number four. A client who's scheduled for a modified radical mastectomy decides to have family members donate blood in the event it's needed. The client has type A negative blood. Blood can be used from relatives whose blood is one, type O positive, two, AB positive, three, type A or O negative, or four, type A or AB negative. And guys, the correct answer is three. Type A or O negative. Now, let me break this down for you so you can understand. Go back to the question. The patient is A negative. They have to get blood that matches. So look at answer choice number three. Type A negative, absolutely, or O negative. Well, Professor D, you just said the blood has to match. Why the O? Because anyone that has O is a universal donor. That means they can give to anyone. But remember, this patient's A negative. So yes, they can get the O for the universal donor, but that O has to be what? Negative. What if that O was positive, even though O is a universal donor? Can't give it because it has to match. So the patient's A negative, they can get A negative, or they can get O from a universal donor, but it has to be what? Negative as well. Let's look at the wrong choices. One, type O. Well, I'm with it so far because O can give to anyone. O, universal donor, yes. But look, it said A, it said O positive. Our patient's negative. So even though that pa the person's an O, because of that positive and our patient's a negative, it doesn't match. You cannot give. Look at choice two, AB positive. First of all, our patient's A and our patient's negative. So that AB positive, absolutely not wrong. And then choice four, type A or AB negative. I was cool with the type A negative because our patient's type A negative. It matches. But look at the second part, AB negative. Excuse me, our patient's not AB negative. Our patient's what? A negative. So that's why number four is wrong. Remember guys, even if part of an answer is wrong, the whole thing is wrong. The whole thing has to be right. And the only one that's correct guys is number three, our A negative and our O what? Negative. It has to match. The practitioner orders a transfusion of two units of packed RBCs for a client. When administering blood, the priority nursing intervention is to one, warm the blood to 98 degrees to prevent chills. Two, use an infusion pump to increase accuracy of infusion. Three, infuse blood at a slow rate during the first 10 minutes. Or four, draw blood samples from the client after each unit is transfused. And guys, the correct answer is three. You're going to infuse the blood at a slow rate during the first 10 minutes. Why? Because it's during that first 10, 15 minutes, if a patient's going to have a reaction usually, it's during that time. And the reason that we give it slowly, just a little bit, is that if the patient does have a reaction, if something went wrong by accident, God forbid, we gave the wrong blood type, right? Only a little bit went into the patient. So the reaction will be diminished. So that's why number three is the correct answer. We want to be able to recognize and stop a reaction as soon as it happens. Okay. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, warm the blood. I just told you that blood needs to be cool, right? So we're not going to warm it. Matter of fact, warming that blood can cause clotting and it can cause hemolysis, the breakdown of those cells. So we don't want that. Choice two, using an infusion pump. You cannot use infusion pump for blood transfusion because it's going to damage those RBCs. Remember, those RBCs are very, very large. Choice four, draw blood samples from the client after each unit transfused. That's not necessary. For what? So the correct answer is choice number three. A client with esophageal varices is admitted to the... Let me start over. You know I can't speak. A client with esophageal varices is admitted with hemat hemodemesis, and two units of packed RBCs are ordered. The client complains of flank pain halfway through the first unit of blood. 
The nurse's first reaction is to one, stop the transfusion, two, obtain vital signs, three, assess pain further, or four, monitor the hourly, hourly urinary output. And guys, the correct answer is one. The first thing you're gonna do is stop the infusion. Whenever something goes wrong, whatever it is that's harming, that's damaging that patient, you're gonna stop it before you do anything else. You're gonna stop it before you assess the patient. Does that make sense that you're gonna sit up there and assess the patient while they're dying? No, stop what's killing them first, then you can do everything else. So guys, the correct answer is choice number one. Halfway through the administration of a unit of blood, a client complains of lumbar pain. After stopping the infusion and replacing the tubing, the nurse should one, obtain vital signs, two, notify the blood bank, three, assess pain further, or four, increase the flow of normal saline. And guys, the correct answer is four, increase the flow of normal saline. And the reason you're doing that, you wanna keep that line patent, number one. And number two, you wanna maintain that fluid volume. Because if you don't do that and you just start assessing and doing other stuff, while you're doing those other stuff, guess what? That patient's fluid volume is decreasing. So that's why you do that. And I want you to notice something. Go back to the question. Notice that it said, after stopping the infusion, the first thing you always want to do is what? Stop what it is that's harming the patient. So the first thing you do is stop the infusion. Then look what it says next. And then replacing the tubing. Why? Because does it make sense, guys, that you're going to go ahead and give that patient normal saline in the same tube that that bad blood was in? Do you know that when that normal saline is infusing into the patient, that bad blood that was in the tube is going to go into the patient to harm the patient some more? That makes no sense. So you're gonna stop what's harming them, but then you need to change the tubing. We don't want any of that blood that was hurting the patient to go into the patient when we start running that normal saline, okay? So notice those two things. And then number three of, of the correct answer, I should say, is increase the flow of normal saline. Again, guys, we wanna keep that line patent and we wanna make sure that um, we keep that patient's volume status increased. A client demonstrates signs and symptoms of a transfusion reaction. The nurse immediately stops the infusion and next. Oh, I already gave you guys the answer. Sorry, guys. One, obtain blood pressure in both arms. Two, send a urine specimen to the laboratory. Three, hang a bag of normal saline with new tubing. Or four, monitor the INO every 15 minutes. You better get this right. So guys, the correct answer is three. Hang a bag of normal saline with new tubing and I explained to you why. Excuse me. Stop the infusion, change that tubing and make sure you give them the normal saline. A male client with chronic liver disease reports that his gums bleed spontaneously. In addition, the nurse identifies small hemorrhagic lesions, lesions on his face. The nurse concludes that the client needs additional one, bowel salts, two, folic acid, three, vitamin A, or four, vitamin K. And guys, the correct answer is four, vitamin K. We had a couple clues here. Go back to the first question. The first one tells us that first clue tells us the patient has liver disease. Well, we know the liver is important for, you know, metabolizing um, drugs, medications, but the liver, isn't that also where those clotting factors are made? So the fact that the patient has any problems with the liver, we already know they're at risk for what? Bleeding. That's why patients who are alcoholics, they've been chronic alcohol users for a long time, we're worried about them bleeding, right? Because those clotting factor most likely is what? Decreased. So that was our first hint, the liver disease. Let's keep going. And then small hemorrhagic lesions. So we know this patient is um, at risk for bleeding out. They've got already small hemorrhagic lesions. Vitamin K. Vitamin K, guys, is needed for the liver to make what? Those clotting factors that I just talked to you about. What specifically vitamin K is important for the synthesis of? Prothrombin. Remember, c -c coumadin, right? What's the antidote for c -c coumadin? Vitamin c -c K. Do you see how it all ties in together? So they gave us clues that led us to the correct answer, which is vitamin K, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, by the way, guys. ADEK, A-D-E-K, just saying. So the correct answer, guys, is number four, vitamin K, one, two, and three is absolutely incorrect. 
During a yearly physical examination, a complete blood count CBC is performed to determine a client's hemato hematologic status. It's composed of several tests, one of which is the level of one blood glucose, two hemoglobin, three C-reactive protein, or four BUN. And guys, the correct answer is two, hemoglobin. So when we're talking about CBC, we're talking about hemoglobin, hematoc hematocrit, RBCs, platelets, all of those are part of the CBCs, uh, WBCs. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. Um, one, blood glucose that tells you patient sugar. Three, C-reactive protein that tells you if um, inflammation is present. Four, BUN that tells you what? Kidney function. Next question. Blood screening tests of the immune system of a client with AIDS indicates, one, a decrease in CD4 T cells, two, increase in thymic hormones, three, increase in immunoglobin E, or four, decrease in serum level of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And guys, the correct answer is one, a decrease in the CD4 T cells. Remember, 300 or less is suggestive of what? AIDS, okay? When taking the blood pressure of a client who has AIDS, the nurse must first, one, don clean gloves, two, use barrier technique, three, put on a mask and gown, or four, wash the hands thoroughly. And guys, the correct answer is four, wash the hands thoroughly. The same you do for any patient, whether they had AIDS or not. Let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, don clean gloves. When do you put on clean gloves? When you expect to come into contact with something wet. When you take a patient's blood pressure, you're not coming into contact with anything wet. You're gonna put on gloves when you expect to come into contact with something wet, such as blood, such as feces, such as vomitus, such as uh, uh, um, sputum, such as bodily secretions. If it's wet, you're going to put on gloves. Choice two, use um, a barrier technique. A barrier technique, a barrier would be something such as gloves or a gown. Anything that protects you, again, you would use a barrier technique if you expect to come into contact with something wet. Choice three, mask and gowns. Um, you'd put that on if you expect it to come across like splatter, blood splatter, feces splatter, vomit, whatever splatter, wet splatter, but you wouldn't expect that when taking a blood pressure. So the correct answer, guys, is number four. A client with A's, with AIDS and Cryptococcus pneumonia frequently is incontinent of feces and urine and produces copious sputum. When providing care for this client, the nurse's priority is to one, wear goggles when suctioning the client's airway, two, use gown, mask, and gloves when bathing the client, three, use gloves to administer oral secretions to the client, or four, wear a gown when assisting the client with the bedpan. <coughs> Excuse me. And guys, the correct answer to, is two. Use gown, mask, and gloves when bathing the client. Remember, you're going to be in close contact with that patient because you're bathing them. And there is a chance that you might get some splatter. So yes, and when I say splatter, splatter is what? Wet, right? So yes, you're going to wear a gown to protect your clothing from that wetness. You're going to wear a mask to protect your face from that wetness. And you're going to wear gloves to protect your hands from that wetness. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, wearing goggles when suctioning the client's airway. Okay, but what happened to the gloves? You're just going to wear goggles? So that's false. Choice three, use gloves to administer oral medications to a client. Since when do we give gloves for PO medication? Do you expect to come into contact with anything wet when you're giving PO medication? Are you putting that pill in the patient's mouth and you're touching their saliva? No. So that's false. And then choice four, use gloves... Excuse me, use uh, wear a gown when assisting the client with the bedpan. What happened to gloves? Last time I checked, if the patient's going to a bedpan, they're going to be either, um, they're going to be having a bowel movement, right? Or there's going to be urine that's wet. Is it the client going to put on, is it the nurse going to put on gowns? 
I can't speak. Is it the nurse going to put on gloves because that's wet? So the only correct answer here, guys, is choice number two. A shilling test is ordered for a client who's suspected of having pernicious anemia. The nurse considers the primary purpose of a shilling test is to determine the client's ability to one, store vitamin B12, two, digest vitamin B12, three, absorb vitamin B12, or four, produce vitamin B12. And guys, the correct answer is three, absorb vitamin B12. So in pernicious anemia, that's what it is. The patient has a problem, what? Absorbing vitamin B12. That is pernicious anemia. So let's talk about this. Um, let me go back to the question. So the purpose of that test, what they do is they give the patient radioactive vitamin B12, and then they test the patient's absorption of that B12 and excretion, how much they get rid of it. So that's why choice uh, number three is the correct answer. When discussing the therapeutic regimen of vitamin B12 for pernicious anemia with the client, the nurse explains that one, weekly z track injections provide needed control. Two, daily IM injections are required for control. Three, IM injections once a month will maintain control. Or four, oral tablets of vitamin B12 are taken daily to provide symptom control. And guys, the correct answer is three. That patient has to get um, vitamin B12 uh, provided exogenously. It's going to be IM every month. And let me be clear about this. If they don't get that vitamin B12, they will die. They cannot survive without vitamin B12. It's given every month intramuscularly, okay? So one, weekly, wrong. I just told you, monthly. Two, daily, wrong. I just told you, monthly. And then look at three, oral. Why would we give vitamin B12 orally when the patient has pernicious anemia? Pernicious anemia, patient cannot absorb vitamin B12. Let me explain this to you guys. So what happens is you have intrinsic factor in your stomach and that intrinsic factor is what makes you able to, well, in your stomach, but it's really in your gastric juices. But anyway, it, that's what makes you able to absorb the vitamin B12. But if you have pernicious anemia, you can't absorb the vitamin B12. So why would you give that to the patient orally? They're going to take it by mouth. It's going to go in their stomach where they cannot absorb the vitamin B12 because of decreased lack of what? Intrinsic factor. That's why the patient has to get it how? Intramuscularly. How often? Every month. And I can't believe this, guys. We are already down to our last question. Wow. Okay, last question, guys. The nurse evaluates that the teaching regarding the use of vitamin B12 injections to treat pernicious anemia is understood when the client states, I must take the drug, one, when feeling fatigued, two, until my symptoms subside, three, monthly for the rest of my life, or four, during exacerbations of anemia. And I know you all got it right. The correct answer is three, monthly for the rest of my life. Why? Because they will die without it. They have to get it I am every month for the rest of their lives. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. I do plan on doing a part two because there is so much more that I want to cover with you guys in regards to blood disorders that I just haven't been able to get to. But let me know what you think about in the comment section, what you'd like to see more of. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. And again, guys, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you for watching this video and you'll see me on the next video.